Ministers his portfolio questions on health and sport. Uh, I'll try and get as many people in as possible, so short and succinct questions and answers, please. And question number one is from Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it's making in meeting its target on cancer strategy to increase NHS scope capacity by an additional 2,000 per annum on a sustainable basis. Jean Freeman. Since 2016, £6 million funding has been released directly to NHS boards, including £1 million annually since 2016-17 for scope capacity. In 2018-19 alone, this supports an additional projected 2,250 scopes through 560 endoscopy sessions. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I'm the grateful recipient of a negative uh, uh, diagnosis after a scope a couple of years ago, and like others, I, I very much welcome that. Uh, can the Scottish Government indicate how it's uh, monitoring the spend by individual health boards and the outcomes that that 2,250 uh, additional scopes in the coming year, in this year, will deliver? Jean Freeman. I'm grateful to Mr Stewart for that supplementary. I'm sure he will recall our waiting times improvement plan, which I published uh, in October. That plan has an operational board, which has a se senior uh, health board and other expertise on it, uh, who will monitor for me both the delivery of the plan against the trajectories that are in it, but also the individual actions of specific boards against the funding that we will release. And we release the funding against specific requests to increase either diagnostic uh, or elective or other uh, capacity in a particular board in order to deliver specific results. So the money is allocated on that basis and the monitoring is done on that basis. Supplementary from Miles Briggs. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As set out in the announcement of the Endoscopy Action Plan, what progress has been made in reducing the number of people waiting for an endoscopy uh, this month alone in December by 5,000, I think the target was set at, and how much of that has been using the private sector? Jean Freeman. Um, the exact number I don't have to hand. I'm very happy to send that to Mr Briggs uh, following uh, today's session. Uh, in terms of the use of the private sector, uh, there is use made of the private sector by some of our boards, but he will also recall that in the waiting times improvement plan, we have a specific action. You recall that plan is in effect in two parts. Uh, one part is to reduce is immediate action to reduce the longest waits and the most clinically serious waits. Uh, which will include, for example, using uh, mobile facilities and so on, and it will include agreement on a national contract with the private sector for specific time-limited use on specific procedures. And once that contract is uh, concluded, then I'm very happy again to uh, ensure that Mr Briggs is aware of its contents and uh, what it requires. Question number two, Jamie Halker johnson to ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made in implementing the recommendations from the Chief Medical Officer's Advisory Group on Maternity and Paediatric Services at Dr Gray's Hospital. Jean Freeman. Uh, NHS Grampian's Phase 1 plan for the reinstatement of maternity service at Dr Gray's includes a summary of actions that they will take against all of the recommendations from the CMO's advisory group and they are making progress against implementation of the actions in that plan, which resulted in 38% of local births in Dr. Gray's in November. In addition to those actions from the CMO group report, the Scottish Ambulance Service have implemented uh, a test of change to improve local ambulance cover in Murray and have recruited additional staff to cover that service. Jamie Halcro Johnson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. She will be aware that the advisory group's report pointed out that communication with women affected had been poor. Almost a month later, there is still a regular complaint from patients with cases arising of women left not knowing who to contact if problems arise during their pregnancies, not knowing even weeks away where they'll give birth and without information about how to get uh, the support that they need. So how does she have confidence that communication from NHS Grampian is working effectively? And will she encourage the chief executive of NHS Grampian to attend the Keep Mum campaign's proposed public meeting in January? And will she consider attending herself? Jean Freeman. I accept absolutely uh, 
Mr Halko Johnson's point about communication. It has, from, uh, from the earliest of days, I believe, been poor. I think NHS Grampian now recognise that. I most certainly do. We as a, a government have worked very closely with them to improve uh, their communication, both with uh, uh, mums and also with uh, residents in and around the Dr Gray's area and uh, more widely. I do think improvement is there to be seen, although I accept that there are still areas uh, where more can be done. Uh, I uh, read earlier uh, today an email exchange uh, in terms of a forthcoming meeting uh, between Keep Mum uh, campaign and uh, the senior uh, member of the board, uh, the executive manager from the board who is currently taking a lead role in and around Dr Gray's and delivering that plan. In terms of the meeting in January then uh, is of course for the chief exec of NHS Grampian to determine what the priorities are for her diary, but I would hope that she would consider this to be a priority. Question number three, Gail Ross. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to improve addiction support services in the Highlands. Joe Fitzpatrick. NHS Highland recently redesigned parts of its drug and alcohol services. An NHS service improvement group is leading ongoing work to reduce the times individuals wait to access drug and alcohol treatment services with a specific focus on reducing waiting times for those requiring opioid substitution therapy. Furthermore, our new alcohol and drug strategy, Rights, Respect and Recovery, outlines how £20 million of additional investment per annum will be available to support the quality and provision of local services in order to better meet the needs of those at risk. Gail Ross. Thank the Minister for that answer. Having been contacted by a number of my constituents recently and given the online petition about increasing addiction services in Caithness, can the Minister tell me how the additional funding recently announced with the new drug and alcohol strategy will be distributed to rural areas where the problem is sometimes not as visible? Joe Fitzpatrick. The additional funding recently announced within the strategy has been allocated across three funds. A total of £20 million has been made available to support service redesign and system change in this financial year. So the three funds are local improvement fund of £17 million made directly available to alcohol and drug partnerships, also the challenge fund and the national development project fund. Over £1 million of that additional investment will go directly to the Highlands to support efforts to make services more accessible and attractive to people seeking help. I have two short supplementaries. John Finney followed by David Stewart. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. The Minister will be aware that statistics show that there were 19 drug-related deaths in the Highlands in 2016. That was an increase of five. And the Minister will also know that police officers are often frequently the first on the scene of such incidents. Could the Minister engage with the Cabinet Secretary for Justice regarding police officers routinely covering, uh, carrying naloxone, please? Joe Fitzpatrick. <clears throat> thank the member for the question which I think is, is a, a very important one. I think he's absolutely right that right across Scotland and probably particularly in rural areas, police will be the, the, the first um, person that will come across someone who is experiencing an overdose. Um, I know that uh, discussions are ongoing and I understand there's been positive um, um, noises uh, coming in relation to the, the proposal that Mr. Mr. Finney, the suggestion that Mr. Finney makes, and so I, I hope there will be an announcement, a positive announcement on that soon, because naloxone is, is something that Scotland is was ahead of the curve in terms of making it routinely available. It's um, I've personally um, undergone the training required to be able to administer uh, naloxone, as have two of the members of my office. So we have a naloxone kit in the office, which is in the town centre in Dundee. Um, so I would, I would encourage anybody else who thinks that perhaps their office is in the right location um, to consider um, speaking um, to, to service managers to, to see if they might um, extend that as well. But police are a very good point. David Stewart. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, does the Minister share the view of Alcohol Focus Scotland uh, that a new public health supplement that provides substantial additional funding for addictive support services in the Highlands and the rest of Scotland? Parliament has already approved this by passing the Alcohol Etc. Scotland Act of 2010. Surely the time is right to provide additional funds to help offset the significant cost to the public sector of dealing with the consequences of alcohol harm. 
Joe Fitzpatrick. Uh, the, me the member uh, makes this point almost on a weekly basis in the chamber, and, and, he, and he's right. This is, is something that w which um, the government and, and certainly myself personally are very sympathetic to. The argument is that um, with the introduction of minimum unit pricing, um, there, there may be a potential windfall. Um, I think the point I've made to the member before is that we need to see what that windfall is. Um, I hope there isn't a windfall because I actually hope that alcohol consumption goes down so there isn't that, that windfall. But if there is, then I think that would be the point when we've got that assessment to consider um, what any, any um, further movement should be. Question number four, Mark MacDonald. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to improve adult oral health. Joe Fitzpatrick. In January this year, we published the Oral Health Improvement Plan. The plan sets out the strategic direction for NHS dentistry, building on the considerable achievements that were made around child oral health and access to NHS dentistry. We'll be introducing a, no, a new programme of preventative care and we will over time be introducing an oral health risk assessment for adults. We also have a programme for government commitment to provide new oral health domiciliary care services which will be rolled out next year. Mark MacDonald. Thank the Minister for his answer. Um, Mouth cancer deaths in NHS Grampian rose in 2017 from 21 to 28. Um, late presentation uh, is often uh, a factor. Um, my father um, ignored an ulcer in his mouth as something that could be dealt with later. Uh, later turned out to be too late. What steps can the Scottish Government take to encourage uh, people to check their mouths regularly and to seek medical advice at the earliest possible opportunity if they notice anything at all unusual? Joe Fitzpatrick. Recognise the member's um, personal interest in this, in this subject. The early detection of oral cancer lies at the centre of our, our proposals. The focus on, oral, on the oral health improvement plan for adult patients is to introduce a more preventative based system for NHS dental care. This means that over time we'll be in, uh, introducing the oral health risk assessment that I mentioned in my first answer. Um, we have envisaged in the Oral Health Improvement Plan a new system of, of preventative care at the centre of which is that, that assessment of adults. Um, and this is considerable enhancement on the current checkup regime where patients will receive tailored services on how to manage and look after their oral health, including advice on lifestyle factors such as smoking and drinking, which are clear risk factors associated with oral cancer. But as well as maintaining the, the free um, NHS dental checks for patients, we've also taken the lead on public health measures, such as being the, the first country in the UK to announce our intention to implement, as soon as practically possible, an HPV vaccination programme for adolescent boys. Question number five, Neil Bibby. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and what issues were discussed. Jean Freeman. Ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, to discuss matters of importance to local people. On Monday, I met with the chair of that board. Neil Bibby. A young constituent of mine in Paisley who is suffering from a severe ear infection has had an operation planned for later this month cancelled due to the closure of the central decontamination unit in Glasgow. She now faces an extra month of agony when she should be studying for her prelims. Another Renfrewshire woman has been told she will have to wait for an ear, nose and throat appointment as an outpatient for 52 weeks. The target is 12 weeks. An FOI passed to me shows that only once have Greater Glasgow and Clyde have managed to see more than 70% of patients within 12 weeks. In August, the target was only met in 41% of cases. Does the Health Secretary believe any of that is acceptable? And what will she do to ensure that patients in Renfrewshire and the west of Scotland get the treatment for ear, nose and throat conditions they are entitled to? Jean Freeman. Uh, I thank Mr Bibby for uh, that supplementary answer. And as he'll know, I've, I've put on record many times, both in this chamber and elsewhere, that I find such long waits completely unacceptable. And I'm very sorry personally for the distress that it causes his constituents, but any other patient who is waiting longer than they should uh, for the treatment that they require. Uh, the waiting times improvement plan is precisely designed to try and address with effective action, targeted action, as we touched on earlier, backed by significant additional resources to uh, reduce those long waits and to tackle the areas where we have particular challenge, either in terms of capacity 
in terms of physical capacity, but also in terms of workforce capacity where we may need uh, to do additional work in order to secure the specialisms that we need. Uh, I believe that when I introduced that plan, I undertook to report to this parliament against the trajectories that it sets out, and I will continue to do that. Uh, but of course, I'm very happy to keep individual members up to date on the relevant uh, propositions coming from boards in their area and which that operating uh, board that I mentioned earlier is approving. I finally do approve them myself, which are very specific actions designed to produce specific results and backed by uh, a particular amount of money and monitored as I described. If supplementaries are fairly short, we can get through more. Annie Wells. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Last week, I was contacted by Anne Hughes, a 75-year-old lady who was unable to visit the out-of-hours GP services at Glasgow's Queen Elizabeth Hospital due to staffing, sort of staffing shortage on the 1st of December. I'm trying to rush now. <laughs> Instead of being able to access the A&E services at the hospital, she was told she had to go to the Royal Alexandra in Paisley or the new Victoria Hospital, hospital and not arriving home until 10 hours after first seeking medical assistance. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that action is being taken to guarantee out-of-hours care is available at all times to patients in our country's largest health vote? Jean Freeman. Uh, I'm grateful to Ms Wells for that question. As it happens, I came before uh, this session from uh, a, a longer discussion uh, with uh, uh, Professor Ru Lewis Ritchie, who, as you know, has undertaken work on out-of-hours services uh, to be updated by him on where we are at the moment. Our out-of-hours services across the country uh, undoubtedly are displaying some degree of fragility and we need to, uh, to be taking the action which we are uh, doing and planning more in order to strengthen that. It, but it is part of the whole system. Uh, it links very strongly to uh, accident and emergency, but it also links very strongly to where we are in terms of our integration of health and social care. And it is that whole system approach uh, which we are trying to drive forward very fast. In, in the case of A&E, uh, a and &E most recently across the country, all our sites have seen a significant increase uh, over what is expected at this time of year in the number of those who are attending. Part of that may be because of out of our services. Part of it is to do with simply with the nature of the weather. And we're doing some investigative work to try and understand who, who are these additional attendees and what might be done. Uh, but I completely appreciate the point uh, that she makes and for that individual uh, who contacted her, she is absolutely right, that that length of time and that further additional travel is uh, completely unacceptable. And I can assure her that we are looking in detail at what we might do. And I'm very happy to discuss with Ms. Wells the specific actions around out of hours that we're taking. Shorter answers would be helpful too. Uh, question number six, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it's making with its plan to equip an additional 500,000 people with CPR skills by 2020. Joe Fitzpatrick. The Scottish Government is working in partnership with Save a Life for Scotland. They've provided CPR for um, learning for approaching 300,000 people since the launch of the out of hospital cardiac arrest strategy in 2015. So they're on target to reach the 500,000 target by the end of 2020. Rhonda Mackay. Thank the Minister for the answer. Last week, Eastern Bartonshire Council committed to training all secondary pupils in life-saving CPR and is the 14th local authority in Scotland to do so. In addition, the British Heart Foundation Scotland is offering to equip every local authority school with a free CPR training kit. Will the Minister join me in encouraging all remaining councils to offer this training? Joe Fitzpatrick. Well, yes, yes, I will. It is really encouraging that these local authorities have committed to CPR training for their secondary school pupils, and I really appreciate the contribution communities and schools are making by purchasing defibrillators. They are taking a huge step towards creating a country of lifesavers and contributing to Scotland's out-of-hospital cardiac arrest strategy. We welcome the efforts of all of our partners to help introduce CPR to everyone, particularly our young people. And we know that the British Heart Foundation are doing a great job in supporting schools with their call, push, rescue kits and Heart Starts training programme. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, can the Minister highlight what the Scottish Government is doing to increase the number of defibrillators across the country and also the need to register them with the Scottish Ambulance Service? Joe Fitzpatrick. Um, I think we would certainly encourage the 
um, access and the rollout of, of def defibrillators uh, for public access defibrillators across Scotland. But I think that the point the member is making about um, knowing where they are is, is, is very important. So um, we know that it is prompt access to defibrillators is, is vital. And so our strategy um, as part of our strategy, the Scottish Ambulance Service Public Access uh, Defibrillators Register is the arrangement for defibrillators to be mapped, maintaining, maintained and accessible to the public. So that enables the Scottish Ambulance Service call handlers to direct a caller uh, to the location of a cardiac arrest um, to a public access defibrillator when one is near. Um, so a critical e element of that is for members of the public, communities, businesses and other partners responsible for public access defibrillators to register the details. So I would encourage people to do that. Question number seven, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the development of new tools for HIV prevention and treatment, what action it's taking to update its 2050 to 20 sexual health and bloodborne virus framework? Joe Fitzpatrick. I'm delighted at the developments we've seen since the update was published in 2015, including Scotland being the first part of the UK to make HIV PrEP available through the NHS service. Work to develop a further update to the framework will begin next year with officials engaging with a wide range of stakeholders to identify areas for further action with a view to publishing an update in 2020. We'll adopt a co-production approach um, which was taken um, in the past, which has supported the progress made across Scotland, such as recently exceeding the UNAIDS 1990-90 um, target for HIV. And I'm happy to engage with the member and others across the cha chamber who have a particular interest in taking this work forward. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to the minister for the answer. And I'm aware that I'm asking this question uh, well in advance of the development of a, of a successor to the the, the, the framework that runs to 2020. But that's deliberate because we now have not only PrEP, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, but also effective post-exposure prophylaxis. And we have levels of uh, treatment now, which not only lead to HIV positive people living long, healthy lives, but the level of viral load being undetectable and the virus being untransmittable. Given these developments, there are many people in the field who feel that it would be appropriate and possible to set a target of zero new HIV transmissions in Scotland. Will the government seriously consider putting that into the next framework update? Joel Fitzpatrick. So, so for, first of all, I think it's important to, to re-emphasise the message of U equals U. I think that's a really important message for us all as politicians to spread as wide as possible because it says to anyone um, who is afraid of having that test because they think it's, it's, it's a life sentence that there is treatment and the treatment um, will, will lead their viral load to be undetectable and that therefore makes it untransmissible. So that's a really, really important message. I think it is really, uh, it's correct for us to be ambitious in this area. So the Scottish Government su supports the ambition of, of zero new HIV infections and I'm, I'm happy to work with obviously the the, the HIV community and the member and others, other stakeholders to look at what would be required to, to take us to the point where we would have confidence to put that into a new strategy. But I, I think it's an ambition that I think across the chamber we will all share. Uh, short supplementaries and answers, please. Mary Fee, followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. HIV Scotland estimate that 13% of people who have the virus are unaware of their status. What action can the government take within the sexual health framework to raise awareness of and reduce this worrying statistic? So, so, so the, the good news is that the progress that we've made means that now that, that figure that Mary Fee talked about of that was 13% is now down to 9%. So that, that puts us um, at, you know, ahead of the, 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 the international targets on that. But absolutely, um, we want to get to the, the point where everyone knows their status. So it, it's not a difficult test for people to get. And I think the U equals U message is one that says to people that there's a really good reason why you should get this test because this is treatable. So I think we just need to keep making that message to get people to encourage them to go and get the test. But we also need to look at new and innovative ways to go out into communities and, and to identify people who may be at risk and encourage them to, to get the test. Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. HIV prevention drug PrEP is currently almost exclusively accessed by men. A third of all people living with HIV are women. Can I ask the Scottish Government what's being done to redress the imbalance of access to the drug? Jo Fitzpatrick. So I think it's, it's first of all important to be clear that uh, PrEP is available to women and it's right that women who are high at risk of 
becoming HIV positive should have access to it. Um, but I, I think the member is absolutely right. There is a lack of awareness which has resulted in a lack of uptake. But there are organisations out there, so Waverley Care, Scottish Drug Forum, um, both organisations which receive funding from the Scottish Government, which are working to raise awareness of PrEP to, to women um, who may benefit from taking it. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's really important that we recognise the work of those third party organisations in, in going out and, and finding um, communities um, who, are, who are at risk and, and making sure that they are aware of their right to PrEP. Question number eight, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Fife and what issues were discussed. Jane Freeman. <clears throat> I chaired the NHS Fife's annual review on the 3rd of December and discussed a number of matters uh, with the Area Clinical Forum, the partnership uh, group and uh, patients and carers and also with the chair and chief executive concerning the board's performance and its improvement plans and on Monday I met uh, the chairs of all the health boards including NHS Fife. Claire Baker. Thank you. Uh, the cabinet secretary will be aware that there are currently 18 GP practices across Fife with full patient lists including all of those in Kirkcaldy and Logelly and most of those in Dunfermline. According to NHS Fife, seven surgeries are experiencing recruitment difficulties, with two considered to be at high risk. I recognise we have seen a small rise in the number of GPs compared to this time last year, but yesterday it was revealed that compared to a decade can ago, we, get to a question, we still please? have fewer GPs, but far more patients. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what guarantees she can give that the pressure on Fife GP services will ease in the interest of patients, and when? Jean Freeman. Well, as Ms Baker recognises, this is an issue that is affecting uh, GP practices uh, in uh, other areas as well. Since uh, 2017, there's been a 10% increase in GP recruitment fill rate. Uh, there are currently 352 doctors in GP training posts across Scotland. Uh, we've also introduced, as she knows, the uh, £20,000 GP uh, training bursary incentive to attract doctors to place placements that have previously been hard to fill. Our new Scott Germ uh, programme for uh, graduate uh, entry level to uh, medical training is in fact located uh, largely in Fife, uh, co-located with University of St Andrews uh, and Dundee, and that is specif specifically focused on a GP career. So we are working hard to increase the number of GPs that we have available to us, the number of GPs uh, trainee posts as well. Um, but in addition, of course, the new GP contract uh, looks to uh, introduce a multidisciplinary team to those general uh, practices in order to ensure that GPs uh, are freed from some of the bureaucratic work they have uh, in the past and, and up to date uh, have to uh, endure, but also that they are freed in terms of their time to deal with the complex issues that we need them to deal with and as the local clinical leader that they are. Supplementary from Willie Rennie. Uh, the Health Secretary will be aware that I oppose the proposals to close the GP out of hours facility in St Andrews. The decision on this will be made by the Fife Health and Social Care Partnership on the 20th of December. So does the Health Secretary agree that it would be sensible to give further time to consider new options for the provision of the service in North East Fife? Jean Freeman. Um, well, Mr Rennie and I have discussed this um, on previous occasions, and indeed uh, we, he has a members' debate tomorrow that I'm looking forward to taking part in. Uh, I absolutely understand the concerns that have been expressed by a significant number of people in North East Fife. Um, I think it would be wise to wait for the proposals that are taken to that meeting on the 20th of December before uh, we jump to conclusions as to what might happen in that area. Question number nine wasn't lodged. Question number 10, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to ensure that sport and physical activity are available to all, irrespective of background or personal circumstances. Joe Fitzpatrick. The Scottish Government believes that there should be no barriers to participating in sport. Everyone should be able to participate in and enjoy sport, whoever they are and whatever their background. In July, we published the Active Scotland Delivery Plan, which sets out our aims to enable people in Scotland to be more active, with a key objective to decrease inactivity in adults and teenagers by 15% by 2030. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have some magnificent national stadium venues in Scotland's cities, 
However, with so many local venues uh, closing, there is, uh, uh, closing their doors, access, especially in rural communities, is ever more difficult. Does the Minister agree with me that the most viable route to access in sport and activity uh, is by utilising the Scottish school estate more efficiently? Joe Fitzpatrick. I, th I think the, me the member makes a good point, um, and, and, and the member knows that I agree with him on, on this point. That I, I think community access to sporting facilities are, are very important, which is why there has been significant investment from Sport Scotland in our community sports hubs up and down the country, making sure that sport is accessible at, um, at that community level, particularly targeting that resource um, at uh, the more deprived communities, at people from um, sections of the communities which are um, less inclined to participate in support um, and also we've, we've, we're looking at um, particularly targeting resources to encourage more women and girls to be involved in support but, but clearly this is a partnership and um, we don't run schools and, and so the partnership with um, the Scottish Government, Sports Scotland, um, our local authorities and community groups all need to work together to get this right. I think if we get it right, we can make a real difference in terms of the health of our nation, and I think that's a goal worth aiming for. Question number 11, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what authority the NHS has to stop family members from visiting a patient in hospital. Claire Hockey. Uh, thank you, Mr Lyle, for your question. People should normally be able to see the friends and family members who are important to them while they are in hospital. The NHS has authority to stop family members visiting someone in hospital when this is the expressed wish of the person, when the family member has been abusive or is presenting a risk to staff or other patients or for sound clinical reasons. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Minister for that answer. One of my constituents have tried to see their daughter in hospital for several months but have been stopped at the entrance of the ward after being told there was a police investigation. They spoke to Police Scotland who state there was no investigation. I have written to the local health board regarding this case and recognise the limitations of the Minister's response. However, could I ask the Minister to ask health boards to ensure that families of patients are treated correctly in future and that information is up to date? as this is causing severe distress to my constituents. Clear hockey. Uh, as Richard Lyle acknowledged in his question, I am limited in what I can say and I can't comment on that individual case. I would normally expect staff to take that decision at the request of the patient, but there may be some small number of cases where a family member is prevented from visiting for other reasons. Health boards should always ensure that patients and their families are treated correctly. And if your constituent feels that this has not been the case, then I would encourage them to raise this directly with the board. The Patients' Rights Scotland Act 2011 provides a specific right for people to make complaints and raise concerns, make comments and give feedback about the care they or a family member has received from the NHS. And the Patient Advice and Support Service exists to help them. The Act also places a duty on NHS boards to thoroughly investigate the issue and to take improvement actions where appropriate. Question number 12, Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the recent figures reportedly showing that the number of doctors in training in Scotland is at a five-time low, how it plans to address issues with GP recruitment. Jane Freeman. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Balfour for the question. I, I think the figures that he's referring to come from the most recently uh, issued figures from ISD. And I would make the point to him that while that he needs to look at two lines in that uh, particular set of figures, both doctors in training and other grades. Uh, and if he looks at both of those lines uh, between 2013 and uh, September 2018, he will see an overall increase in that. And the reason I'm asking him to look at both is because under other grades is where we have doctors in training but they are uh, doctors who are also clinical fellows. There are doctors who are uh, locums as well as in training. So you need to take both of those figures together in order to um, understand what the real picture is. That said, uh, of course, Mr. Balfour will know that I am not the least bit complacent about our workforce numbers and about the work that we need to do uh, to increase uh, the accessibility and the capacity that we have across our whole health and social care workforce. So without repeating myself, uh, presiding officer, because I know you're keen that we move on, I would make the point that Scottish GP recruitment has seen a 10% increase. We have those other measures that I talked about in terms of the bursary, Scott Gem course, the increase in the 
the number of medical undergraduates and the specific focus in some of those programmes on GP training, particularly in remote and rural areas. In terms of the further detail on that, again, I'm very happy to talk to Mr Balfour uh, outside of this session to take him through the specific measures. Jeremy Balfour. Um, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for answering and can I just remind members that I have a number of close family members who are doctors and also training to be doctors. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary makes some interesting points, but the programmes created in 2015 and 17 and in the summer of this year are overall obviously simply not working. Would the Cabinet Secretary not agree that actually a radical new action is needed to get more doctors and more GPs working here in Scotland? Jean Freeman. Well, it, it's an interesting proposition. It falls down by not telling me what that radical new action might be. Um, so I'm a bit stuck to say whether or not I agree that there is a radical new action. I think we are taking a number of steps. I would remind the member that you don't produce GPs quickly. Quite rightly, you don't produce them quickly because you want them to undergo extensive training, both as undergraduates and then as graduate medical doctors in training to go through all of those measures. But I'd also remind them that we're talking about a health and social care workforce across a whole system. The GP contract is specifically designed, agreed with, uh, negotiated with and agreed with uh, the BMA GP group in order to ensure that our GPs in particular uh, can, can come forward as the local clinical leaders that they are with that multidisciplinary team so that we can focus their highly specialised and important skills on the patients who need them most. So in the absence of detail on a radical action, my answer to that is no, I don't. Quick supplementary, please, from Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the biggest threat to our NHS workforce is the danger that Brexit poses to the staffing of Scotland's NHS, as reported in the new survey of EAA doctors by the British Medical Association? Jean Freeman. Well, well, yes, I absolutely do. And I'm sorry that the members to my left here, purely in the geography of this chamber, clearly, um, <laughs> the members to my left here groan about that matter because it is self-evidently the case. And I tell you what makes it even worse, presiding officer, when the UK government will not assist this Scottish government in meeting our objective of paying the resettlement fees, a ridiculous proposition, actually, for people who live and contribute to our country, who will not assist us in meeting those resettlement fees in order to demonstrate in the practical way that we can, in the absence of any other half-decent powers, that these individuals working in our health service are welcomed and valued and we want them to stay. Question number 13, Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made in repatriating ophthalmology services from NHS Grant into Island Health Boards. Jean Freeman. Uh, thank you. Um, as the member will know, NHS Grampian provides a visiting ophthalmology service to NHS Shetland every two months. The multidisciplinary team provide four clinical sessions over two days, but some treatments do, however, require patients to travel to Aberdeen to receive their care. A meeting has been scheduled between NHS Shetland and NHS Grampian for January uh, 2019 to discuss the provision of these services on Shetland and actions to progress this and including whether services can be sustainably delivered in Shetland in the future and associated timelines will be agreed at that meeting. Tavish Scott. I'm, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Would she recognise that there are now some older people in the islands in Shetland who now do not travel to Aberdeen uh, for uh, essential eye injections simply because of the disruption, uh, the travel and the difficulties that that means for uh, people uh, uh, undertaking that visit? Would she therefore redouble these efforts to make sure that when that meeting happens, it makes decisions about ensuring this essential services, service can take place in Shetland to the great benefit of those pe pe elderly people in particular? Jean Freeman. Uh, I do recognise uh, the issues that the member uh, raises and I will take a personal interest in how that meeting progresses and what actions uh, it agrees to and the timelines that it sets and ensure that Mr Scott is made aware of those. Question number 14, John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment this is made of the effectiveness of the power of attorney in health cases. Claire Hockey. 
We recently undertook a consultation on making changes to the adults with incapacity legislation. We know from that work that using powers of attorney can encourage people to think through how they might want their health, welfare and financial affairs to be managed in the future if they are unable to make decisions themselves on these matters. This means that adults who use powers of attorney are better placed to be as involved as possible in decisions about their lives, even if their circumstances change. John Finney. Um, I thank the Minister for that reply. Does the Minister believe there are sufficient checks and balances in place for all parties uh, when a public body seeks to take over a power of attorney? Claire Hawkey. Uh, well, as I alluded to uh, in my previous answer, there certainly is a review of the Adults with Incapacity Act uh, ongoing, and I'm sure this will be a, um, a subject that will be uh, reviewed during that. Uh, I'll take question 15 because I know it can be a short answer. Bill Bowman. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making with its plan to equip an additional 500,000 people with CPR skills by 2020. <laughs> Joe Fitzpatrick. I refer the member to my previous answer to Ronan Mackay. <laughs> Bill Bowman. Okay, well, well as we heard earlier, <laughs> and British Heart Foundation Scotland is offering to equip every local authority school with free CPR training kit and training takes less than 30 minutes to complete. The Scottish Government has now made LGBTI education compulsory in the curriculum. Will it not do the same for life-saving CPR when international evidence shows that doing so has the potential to triple survival rates from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest? So, Joe Fitzpatrick. Um, so just, just, just to say, I think it's fantastic what the British Heart Foundation are doing, and I think it's, it's great the work that schools up and down the, the, the country are making, but obviously ultimately it's for schools to decide when it's appropriate for them to provide this support. That concludes portfolio questions in health and sport, and we'll move on to the next item of business.